Now, back in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, NASA, when, when the age of manned spaceflight really got, in, got underway, NASA um, came up with this way to return the space capsules to Earth. And the way that they did that, you can kind of see it there on the screen, they, they, you know, it went up on a rocket, either went to the moon or went or orbiting the Earth several times, and then the capsule came back down using a heat shield to, to absorb the heat as it passed through the upper atmosphere, deployed three big parachutes, and then splashed down into the ocean. It would be somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean, you know, west or um, east of, of Florida. It was this splashdown. And, and of course, that worked in a lot of ways because the water was the shock absorber and the, the capsule could hit that water and, and, and uh, you know, it wouldn't be as, as rough as the way the Soviets did it. The Soviets had their capsules come down on land, right? You know, that might have been a little bit jarring um, to, to hit land. I guess they must have used more parachutes or something. But um, NASA had them come back down and hit water. Well, it works pretty well, except that there were, there were a few close calls. On, on one instance, there was a, a capsule that blew its top, blew its, uh, the hatch open before the time when the ship got near it and could get the astronauts off, and the capsule sunk. Um, and luckily, the, the individual on board was able to, I don't know how, but somehow swam out and got to safety, even though the capsule sunk. Um, later, they added on some, some flotation devices around the capsule so that it would kind of bob there while the ship would pull up alongside of it. But that was its splashdown. It comes down to Earth, hits the water, and then the astronauts, uh, you know, plunges into the safety of the water, and the astronauts emerged into the air into a new life. Well, here we are in the Gospel of Matthew, and John the Baptist has been preaching in the desert, and he's been baptizing in the Jordan River, and the time is right, and people sense that God is doing something. John has attracted a crowd, and then of all people, Jesus shows up. And John's been preparing the way of the Lord. And in part, what he's been doing is calling people to repentance and baptizing them. And, and, and he's been saying that it's time to confess your sins. And then the Lord that he'd been preparing the way for came to him to be baptized. Except that John didn't know the whole of it just then. John would later ask of Jesus, are you the one who is to come or should we wait for another? But John was certain and he knew that there was something special about Jesus. There was something holy about Jesus, something that made Jesus different and his request to be baptized seem outlandish. And you see this in verse 14 where John says, he said to Jesus, he tries to deter him and he says, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? But Jesus insisted. Everyone else was coming down to the water to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, but Jesus had another reason in mind. He didn't need the forgiveness of sins. The scriptures tell us that Jesus was just like us in every way except without sin, but Jesus desired to set an example for us by baptism. He calls all of us to follow him through the waters and to be baptized. Jesus was baptized in solidarity with humanity. Baptism was Jesus' great splashdown. It was the moment when you could say he landed in the waters of earth and he showed his complete identification with humanity. And baptism is our splashdown moment as well. It's the moment when we begin a new life in Christ and we are called into solidarity with the world. And you see this in the way this scene unfolds, right? Jesus shows up on the banks of the river. Uh, it's, it's the Jordan River. And you can kind of imagine what this would look like. There would have been all these people it's like those old-timey pictures that you can see sometimes in, in black and white where everybody's coming down to, to be baptized. And, you know, there's this line of people, folks from every walk of life. You know, there were Pharisees, there were Sadducees, people who were on the inside of the religious status quo. But there's just all kinds of folks. And John would have been preaching repentance and then people would have been streaming down to the, the water and, and, uh, and confessing their sins, seeking forgiveness. And John's baptism was this form of washing that was related to the ritual washings of the Old Testament. So, for instance, in the Old Testament, in the temple in Jerusalem, there was this huge bronze pool of water. It was called the Molten Sea or the Bronze Laver. It was supported by 12 oxen. And we know that was used by the, the priests to, to wash up as part of their, their service in the temple. There was also these carts filled with water that were outside of the temple. Those were used for washing. 
um, the priests would wash themselves. So, you know, the people had this vision of washing. They knew what it was for. They got it, right? Um, you know, the Pharisees practiced lots of ritual washing, and, and they have this dispute with Jesus about that at one point. But G- John, John is preaching this message that it touches on that, that live wire in the Old Testament of the ritual washing and applies it to all of the people, saying, now is the time, come and be forgiven, be washed. And Jesus shows up. You know, did, did John spy him out at the back of the crowd? Was, was John standing down the, in the water as people came to him one by one, and then suddenly he looks up and he sees, it's Jesus. You know, what's, what's he doing here? Who knows how this would have played out for John, but there must have been this moment where John recognized that Jesus was coming to him to be baptized. He tries to turn him away. He says, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me? And Jesus gives an interesting response. Jesus doesn't say, yeah, I need to be forgiven of my sins just like everybody else. He doesn't say that. No, Jesus knows that he is different. Jesus is operating on a different set of assumptions. And he responds to John's doubts in verse 15. He says, uh, let it be so now. It is proper for us to fulfill, to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented to baptize him. And that's kind of a mouthful. But what this means is that Jesus' baptism is not meant for the forgiveness of his own sins, but to fulfill all righteousness. And that means two things. The first is that Jesus is setting an example. And part of what that means is that Jesus came for the redemption of the world, and he's setting, his life is setting an example, right? Jesus is blazing a trail for all of us to follow throughout the ages, not just his disciples in that immediate time frame, but for everybody. This is why the epistle to the Hebrews says that Jesus is the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. He's the one that goes ahead. So being a Christian is, it's above all, it's following Jesus. In some ways, it's just that simple. It's, it's living our life as if Jesus were in our shoes. And that includes baptism. We follow Jesus' example in baptism. And for us, baptism is, it means the forgiveness of sins. Baptism means our response in faith to God's calling upon our lives. Baptism is dying to sin, being reborn to life in Christ. And by his actions, Jesus is showing us the power of baptism. He's commending baptism to us. He is opening up this new kind of baptism, which is Christian baptism. And the second thing that this response that Jesus gives, the second thing this means is that his baptism will fulfill all righteousness. Um, And what that means is that by going through baptism, it's the right thing to do. He's entering into solidarity with all of humanity. Jesus is the representative human being. That's why he's called the Son of Man in the scriptures at a lot of places. And so when he is baptized, part of what he is doing, or when we are baptized, part of what we're doing is joining Jesus in his baptism. And as the waters of the Jordan close over Jesus' head, the heavens open up, and the Spirit descends on him in the form of a dove, and the Father's words reverberate through the air. This is my Son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. And through Jesus, those are the words that God is speaking over all of us when we are baptized. Because God loves all people. And God loves us before we're baptized. And the, the, the only reason anybody ever makes it to the saving waters of baptism is because God's grace is at work in their lives, healing them from sin and, and drawing them to that water. Because we cannot say yes to God in order to be baptized, except by God's providential love preparing the way in us. But there's a way in which, in baptism, we are sealed to God's love. In baptism, we are bound to God's love. And we find ourselves entering into a new reality in which the love that God has always had for us, a love that extends back to the time Uh, we were born, and even beyond that, from before we were born, before our parents were born, before the creation of the world, that love begins to be revealed and to open up in baptism. We splash down into a new reality. Jesus paved the way for us to pass through the waters and to experience that love. uh, Jesus was baptized in solidarity with humanity. And here's the thing. As theologian Rowan Williams puts it, To be baptized is to recover the humanity that God first intended. 
And the reason for this is that baptism leads us into a living and loving relationship with God. And that's what God has always intended human life to be about. We should live with an awareness of God. We should live with a love for God, with God's love moving through and extending out into the world through us. And so in that way, baptism, it's not to become superior to the, you know, the unwashed masses or something like that. To be baptized is to live into God's vision of humanity, which is precisely what we see in Jesus. Baptism is a sign of the transformation that God is working in a person's life. And baptism transforms. You know, when we look at the global church, we can see how it's the stories of lives transformed that impacts people to commit their lives to Jesus in baptism. So in the country of Thailand right now, there's this powerful Jesus movement that's afoot as the gospel is penetrating out into diff different ethnic groups where there are few people who believe in Jesus or have even heard the gospel. And I read a, an interview with a guy named Bob Kraft who leads a mission organization in Thailand. And he talks about how um, it's really the testimonies of Jesus and how Jesus has transformed people's lives that lead others in these remote villages to accept and to consider the claims of the gospel. And those are baptismal stories. They are stories that come from baptism and lead to baptism. People tell their story and others hear that and say, I, I want to know more. Or look at the church in Muslim-majority countries, places where uh, folks like our mission partners, the Larsons, are working. People come to Christian faith in these countries, and it's often at great risk. Right? They, they need our prayer, uh, as do folks like the Larsons who are seeking to come from outside and to lay the groundwork for them to hear the gospel. And I read a story recently of a group of believers in a Muslim-majority country, and they were preparing for baptism. And as they were, they were standing there in a line, and the church had a couple of pastors, as they were standing there in a line, uh, giving their testimonies and going into the waters of baptism, they're, they're standing there in that line, <clears throat> and they get a message that one of the other pastors of the church um, had, who had disappeared had been killed. And so that pastor right there on the spot, as they are standing there preparing for baptism, you know, knowing that their lives are at risk, he says, do you still want to be baptized knowing this, that that other pastor has been killed because of his Christian faith? And there, there's no turning back, right, at baptism. They will likely face persecution. And the, in that story, they said that none of the people who were preparing for baptism turned back. They still came to Christ in that moment. Baptism marks this powerful moment of transformation, of shift from one set of allegiances to another. And you know, when we have experienced that baptismal transformation, we are called to share the transforming power of Jesus with others. So Jesus splashed down into our world, into the midst of our sins and confusions and conflicting emotions and warring desires. And that's what, as followers of Jesus, we're called to to do as well. Get this. Baptism does not yank us out of the world. Baptism uh, sends us into the world, but in a different way. It sends us in changed, with a mission. Through baptism, we live and we move in solidarity with God's transforming love in the world, which means that we have a different relationship to the world. You know, a lot of things can look the same, at least outwardly, but then when you kind of dig down into them, they start to have, you know, a, a different, different reason for why we do what we do and why we act the way we do. So things can look the same, but there's an, out, an inward uh, drive that, that changes the meaning of, of what we are and what we're doing. So, you know, we have jobs and families and houses, but because of our baptism, those things start to take on different meanings. So we seek work, right? We have a job, but we seek work that, that builds up. We seek work that heals. We seek work that creates a, a better community. Or in just whatever our work is, we seek to do it well, to do it with integrity, to do it in a way that expresses kindness and love for others. Or we have families, and our families become places where God's love is put into concrete action, where children are, are raised not just to become good citizens or whatever, but to be disciples, disciples 
right? This is why the church is really the ecclesia domestica, the domestic church, the first place where faith formation happens. And we pray over our children, and we pray over our nieces and nephews, and we pray over the kids next door, and we commend them into the care of Christ. And our houses become this place of hospitality, right, where the stranger is welcomed and the the hungry are fed. So it, it might look the same, but it becomes something entirely different. There's a different power animating our lives. And God doesn't take us out of the world at our baptisms, right? On the contrary, God sends us further in, but transformed and transforming. And that's what we see in Jesus' baptism, right? Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan, and that immediately sets him on a collision course with the devil. Satan understands that, that Jesus' baptism amounts to a declaration of war. It's a sign that Jesus isn't just visiting earth. He didn't just uh, splash down and now he's on his way out. He has splashed down permanently. The life of God entering deeply into the life of humanity. And so after his baptism, Jesus is tempted by the devil in the desert. And then he ends up back in Galilee, freeing people from sickness and suffering. And then he's teaching on, in the Sermon on the Mount, and he's freeing people from the chains of mind and heart that bind them. Jesus demonstrates what it looks like for him to enter into the world in solidarity with it. You know, it's, a sort, of, it's sort of like that thing that we always say um, that's, you know, we quote it like scripture. It's not exactly in the scripture in this precise form, but we, we quote this, we say this, we say, you know, as Christians, we are in the world, but not of it. Have you ever heard that? Right? In the world, but not of it. It's, it's got a scripture sound. It's not in the Bible precisely in that phrasing, but it's a sentiment that you see at various places. So Paul, in the world, but not of it. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 5, he says that that Christians should, it's, should not associate with immoral people. But then Paul goes on to say, well, I did not mean all the immoral people of this world, for then you would have to go out of the world. Or Jesus prays for his disciples in the Gospel of John 17, 15. He says, my prayer is not that you take them. He's talking to God. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Or James writes that we are to keep ourselves unstained by the world. Um, so in the world, but not of it. It sort of sums up those sorts of statements in scriptures. We are in the world, but with this different orientation within the world, with, it, with a different vision for what it looks like to live and to move in the world. And you see this in the early church, right? In the book of Acts, the church goes from being this band of people praying in a closed-off room in Jerusalem, afraid, to being this movement of spirit-empowered missionaries who are going out into the world to spread the Jesus message and to live the Jesus way, whatever the cost. And baptism is right at the heart of what they're doing. So right after God pours out the Holy Spirit on them in Acts chapter 2, it's this, this tremendously impactful moment. And people say to the apostles, well, what do we have to do? And Peter says, here's what you have to do. You've seen the power of God. Here's what you have to do. Repent and be baptized, right? And right after they, get that they are baptized, all these people come to faith. We see the, the church immediately experiencing persecution. And we see the apostles healing and teaching. We see this whole system set up for caring for widows in need. And we see people gathering regularly to eat and to share in each other's homes. So the church doesn't draw out of the world. Um, it doesn't withdraw because of baptism. The church goes into the world, is sent back in in a different way. And I want to underline something here. I want to underline the fact that baptism doesn't remove us from suffering. And in fact, I think sometimes it's quite the opposite, right? That the faithfulness that baptism calls forth in us will sometimes lead us directly into places of, of suffering. That was the case for the early church, and that's really been the case throughout the ages and suffering for our faith continues to be a possibility for people everywhere, including us, even though we live in a place that's relatively free. But even, even just daily suffering, right? Just set aside suffering for our faith, set aside martyrdom and all of that. Even just daily suffering, even just the suffering that comes with being human in a broken world where we get sick and we experience loss and we know death, even our experience of that suffering is transformed by baptism and We've got to tread carefully here. I mean, there, there's, there is great mystery in talking about this. 
it's true also that part of following Christ always means seeking to heal and to alleviate suffering. That includes our neighbor's suffering, our children's suffering, our own suffering. But even still, baptism sets us at a different angle to the human condition. In his book, The Seven-Story Mountain, Thomas Merton documents his journey from being a a wayward young man growing up mostly in France to becoming a a Catholic monk. It's this very surprising journey, kind of a slow-motion sort of transformation. And Merton was familiar with certain kinds of suffering, including the loss of both his mother and his father when he was young, and then the physical pain of, of dental issues and an age before antibiotics. I mean, Merton was laid up in bed for weeks with tooth infections that now we would deal with with, you know, a 10-day course of inexpensive pills. But Merton says this about suffering. He says, the truth that many people never understand until it's too late is that the more you try to avoid suffering, the more you suffer because smaller and more insignificant things begin to torture you in proportion to your fear of being hurt. You know, I think the bigger issue is that it's natural for us to move away from pain and suffering, to want to distance ourselves from those who are hurting and from the hurt of the world. And what I think baptism does is it challenges us in that. Baptism doesn't rocket us out of the hurt of the world. Baptism splashes us back down into the thick of it. And this is why we go and sit with those who are experiencing loss, This is why we pick up after disasters. This is why we volunteer to do relief and development work in difficult places around the world. Why in a couple of weeks, there's all these folks going to get together to to, uh, tie comforters, right? Those go to to refugees and folks who are um, trying to rebuild their lives after disaster. You know, we don't have to take responsibility for the world's suffering, and we don't have to try to fix everything. But our baptisms mean that we aren't allowed to flee it. We aren't allowed to retreat to a bubble. Um, We aren't allowed to kind of live a nice imaginary life where everything is A-OK. Baptism sends us out. Baptism sends us in. I think about D.L. Mayfield, who is a writer who moved with her family into a low-income apartment complex in Portland, Oregon. It was a, a home to mostly Somali and other immigrants right there in the heart of Portland. And D.L. Mayfield, she could have been living a nice middle-class life. That's what she grew up in. But instead, she found herself in this low-income apartment complex, sitting on the couches of people whose language she didn't understand. And Mayfield taught English in a local community center, and even as she was and is doing it, um, living the Christian life of solidarity, she, she recognized that it was challenging. She recognized that it wasn't everything she had imagined. And Mayfield writes this, The idealism underpinning our desire to live in solidarity with the poor would end up taking so much time and energy that at night we found ourselves unable to do anything else but lock our doors and collapse in front of the TV. And Mayfield writes that they discover just how complicated people's lives are and just how resistant their tangled lives can be to our efforts to do good and to make a difference or to change the world. And, you know, this is what I think makes baptism a uniquely powerful way of being in the world. You see, baptism doesn't call us to be superhumans or even super Christians. Um, That's not what baptism calls us to. There's a humility built into baptism. There's a recognition of our limits. There's There's a recognition of our own profound need for grace. Baptism does not deputize us as little saviors. God forbid that we get that idea. The world does not need saviors. It's got a perfectly good savior already. What baptism does is reorient us so that we can live fully human lives in the world the way that God intended. And then we just go out and live. And then good things happen, not because of our good intentions, because they're not always that good, but because of God's mercy and God's love working through us. Today we mark and we celebrate the baptism of the Lord. And if you have been baptized, especially if you were baptized as a young person or as an adult and and, and you have a memory of that, bring it to mind today. Remember your baptism. Remember the grace that God gave you that day. Um, Even if you don't remember your baptism, embrace your baptismal identity and mission. And if you've been baptized, hear God's call on your heart 
Hear the words that the Father spoke over Jesus as he came up out of the water as words that are intended for you, words that are calling you to the river's edge. These are the words. You are my child. You are my son or my daughter whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. 